I know that it can come across a little bit bold to say that computers would not exist without fabric or textiles or the textile industry, but hang on with me through this and I'll explain to you why and what wonderful textile roots computing and computers have. Do you all know what these are? Have you seen these before? If you're familiar with computer history, then you'll know that these are the punch cards that would feed information into our early computers. And if you've been around on this channel for a while or you're just a machine knitter yourself, then you'll recognize these punch cards as the punch cards that I feed into my knitting machine to create patterns. You might be thinking to yourself that these two look kind of similar and the reason is is because they are both based on the exact same thing which is the jacquard loom. And when Charles Babbage was building and writing about the analytical engine although it never got fully built he turned to the punch cards of the jacquard loom as the way to feed data and information into his machine and the analytical engine was the earliest theorized computer for which Ada Lovelace wrote wrote the first programs. So if you want to understand a little bit more about this connection and why these punch cards were so important for computers, for textiles, and how that all developed, we kind of have to go back to understanding exactly what is the jacquard loom and why was it so revolutionary. If you've ever heard of figured fabric or jacquard fabric or damask, then you'll recognize it as a piece of fabric with a highly, highly intricate pattern on it. And the jacquard loom was invented in the early 1800s to make the process of making those fabrics much easier and went from having two people needed to work one loom to just one person working a loom. To kind of explain this to you, I think we kind of have to go back to some weaving basics to see how much of a innovation this particular add-on is. Okay, so we're gonna take it this very simple version of a loom right here. It's literally just a picture frame. I do have an actual loom, but I think it's a little easier to see what I'm talking about when we view it on a simpler version first. Two terms that are important in weaving, warp and weft. Warp is what goes up and down on your particular loom and the weft is what you weave right and left. I learned from Jillian Eve the way to remember that easily is you go warp speed ahead and you weave from right to weft. So the weft is what kind of makes up this fabric, right? So weaving is made up of crossed bits of yarn. So the warp goes this way and then when you're weaving you weave right and left in between these. In the most simple version of a fabric, what we do is we weave above the first string, under the second string, above the third string, under the fourth string. Now a very early technique that was used to do this and one that you can still use today is literally by threading a thread through your needle and I'm using a contrasting color to go over the first string, under the second string, over the third, under the fourth, and so on and so forth until you're able to pull your weft through and you are already starting to create a fabric. Did that take a while? Yeah. <laughs> and so people figured out that if you run every other thread through something called a heddle held up in a shaft so that you can easily pull those threads apart and create a space for your weft thread to go through, that's a much faster way of weaving. And so what we just did and what we're just doing right now is called a plain weave. However, if you're currently wearing, let's say a pair of jeans, you've got some denim on and you're looking down and it's got a little bit of that diagonal look in the structure of the fabric, that's what's called a twill. And very commonly, like the most simple forms of twills, you are required to have four separate shafts and to thread every group of four fibers is connected to a different shaft that lifts up and down to create different spaces to create that pattern. So that's like the simplest twill. Now let's look back at some of the damask and jacquard silks that are out there. Can you imagine the amount of combinations you have to do in order to create that pattern in the fabric just by lifting different warp threads to kind of create that pixel. Like think of it like pixels in a picture and that's what you have to lift to create the pattern in your fabric. So the first version in how they managed to do that is they connected each and every warp thread to a shaft that stuck up and there was a draw boy or draw girl sitting on top of the shafts and then based on the row that they were weaving he or she would lift those particular shafts that needed to be lifted one by one you would lift that particular string and the weaver could weave that work so for every row the draw boy or draw girl had to lift 
the required shaft in order to do that. And this is what's called a draw loom. As early as 1725, Basile Bouchon, and I'm sorry I'm not French, so these are a lot of French names and I'm not gonna get them all right. I tried though, I really tried looking them up. Invented a way for a punch card to automate the picking of which threads needed to be lifted. Because as you can imagine, if, especially if there's a small child sitting in front of a pattern for 12, 14, 16 hours a day, there's going to be mistakes made in which strings to lift up to make the pattern. So that kind of reduced one way of mistakes being introduced into the pattern making. Basile Bouchon invented it, and then his assistants Jacques Valcassin and Jean-Baptiste Falcon improved upon that device. But then we come around to 1801 and Joseph-Marie Jacquard invented the fully automated process. So the ones before that I mentioned automated the picking up of the threads, but someone still had to be there to make the threads be picked up to activate that mechanism so it was still two people per loom. Whereas Joseph-Marie Jacquard, he created an entire apparatus that would sit on top of these draw looms and automated the process fully with these huge cards of the patterns punched into them. Like it's amazing to see pictures of these punch cards, they still exist, Jacquard looms still exist out there that are functional, you can see them. I've always wanted to see one working in real life. How cool would that be? But this is really where the punch card idea started. And Ada Lovelace even has a direct quote. We may say most aptly that the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And I think that's just wonderful because for maybe there's times where people think like this came first and so that later thing probably inspired the first thing, but we see here Ada Lovelace who worked very closely together with Charles Babbage on the analytical engine, which is the first computer, directly drew their inspiration for how data and information was written and processed into their analytical engine. And I think that's just a wonderful comparison to see. So the punch card, that's one of the first ways that it was used in kind of a computational context. And then Herman Hollerith used that punch card idea in 1890 to input the data from the 1890 U.S. Census and process that information, which I was just, my mind was blown when I learned that piece. Herman then founded the Tabulating Machine Company, which a few years later amalgamated with three other companies to turn into the Computing, Tabulating, and Recording Company, which was renamed in 1924 to the International Business Machines Corporation, or IBM. <laughs> so I think it's really interesting to see how computers today developed from the Jacquard loom, from the analytic engine to the census processing machine through to IBM in the 1950s and 60s using these punch cards through to the 70s still. So computers as they are today would not be the same without the Jacquard loom directly inspiring Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace in their analytical engine to the 1890s census processing all the way up to now. The textile industry I think has a way further reach in the development of different areas of our lives that we still rely on and use every day today. Math, our financial and banking institutions and banking systems in general, the entire industrial revolution. I find it all really interesting, so if you want to know more about all that, please do let me know. There are also other fun ways in which computers and textiles are close to each other. So some of the other data storage mechanisms is called rope core memory. And when you look at how that memory is stored or how it is created, it's literally by weaving copper wires together through rings. And when you look at it in its totality, it it looks like a woven fabric. So it's like a woven computer program. It's a physical manifestation of a computer program that was written and debugged. You have an art project, which I have always wanted to see. I don't know if it's still on display though, where I think it was in 2016, the artist literally embroidered in gold thread a working computer into fabric. And I find that so cool. I would love to see that work in real life. Anyhow, I will leave my references that I use to kind of research this in the description below. And let me know if you're interested in any more of this kind of information, like how we got to where we are today and how a lot of that is based in the textiles industry and textile creation in our past. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe if you like things like this and I will see you all again very, very soon. Bye. <laughs>